Welcome back to the Venari podcast. I'm Gov Candola, and we are joined for this episode by Sanjay Vias. Sanjay is the Global Strategic Business Unit Head um, within Clinical Supplies and Logistics at PowerXL. Uh, PowerXL, obviously, are a leading international provider of biopharmaceutical services. Sanjay, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gov. Pleasure to be here. It's great to have you on. And in today's episode, we're going to be discussing cold chain logistics, um, what it is, you know, the advancements that have been made, especially over the past two years, um, but also the challenges facing organizations within this vertical. Um, so to kick us off, Sanjay, um, you know, what is cold chain logistics, but also how has it been affected by COVID? It is interesting that during COVID, every single logistics strategy that we in the past thought was actually an alternative strategy suddenly had to become a mitigation strategy. And yeah. that was the interesting part that COVID led to. And, and, and when you talk about cold chain, especially with the complex medications and the shipment of those complex medications, it became all the more challenging because at this point of time, we were talking about the borders closing down, the trade compliance became a huge issue, the airlines availability uh, came to a standstill. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, even many of the governments started putting a restriction in terms of the medications that could move from their respective borders onto other borders as well. So all this complexity is further added to the overall cold chain logistics as well. So I think it's just piled up all over each other. But at the end of the day, I also believe there's a silver lining to this pandemic because we were forced to start looking at many of the alternative logistics strategy as a mitigation strategy and there were many new innovations that also came in during the same time yeah it's been insane there has been some rapid growth within this space over the past two years obviously the agenda has slightly shifted uh, in terms of uh, you know the pharmaceutical space in terms of vaccines um, but obviously with the changes we're experiencing within this vertical you know do we anticipate more pharmaceutical companies to outsource capabilities to contract uh, manufacturing organizations within the space it, it is, and it's an interesting question because it's, it's, it's going both ways, interestingly, Gov, because I have seen many, like, for example, with a clinical research organization like Parkcell, we mm -hmm. were at a huge advantage that being a clinical study conduct provider, uh, we were also having a logistics arm within the same part of the organization. So for us to connect a GMP world with the GCP world became much, much more easier because it was like we understood how the study was conducted, but we were able to get the supply chain mitigation strategy because many of our patients were waiting at the end of the line due to pandemic, due to closures. They were not able to go to the investigator sites to get their drugs done, but having that in-house became a huge differentiator from a supply chain perspective. But having said that, uh, it is also certainly supply chain has become, has got a seat on the table suddenly on the, on the board discussions as well, because it has become very critical that many sponsor companies have started looking at uh, developing molecules or developing pharmaceutical drugs as the core forte. And whereas they have started thinking about, hey, let's talk about working with a partner who understands the logistics piece pretty well, and then start outsourcing that. So I would say it's a combination of both. It depends on which industry are you talking about. If you're talking to the pharmaceutical industry, then yes, the outsourcing has become more. If you're talking about to the clinical research industry, then they're talking about getting more in-house and better control over the end-to-end -end drug supply piece of it. Perfect. Uh, you highlighted, obviously, the logistical challenges that are involved as well. I was going to ask direct to patient possibilities. Now, given the narrow time frame for deliveries and pickup, um, you know, of biologics and sample yeah. materials, is this possible? It's a, it's a very interesting and it's a pretty broad question, Carl, because uh, I can only give you my personal opinions. If from my personal perspective, I think direct to patient decentralized trials, uh, home nursing and all that stuff is here to stay. But the question is, as I said, you know, when the challenges happen, all these strategies came as a savior, you know, like uh, uh, to save the whole logistics process uh, a piece of it. We had to go through a lot of protocol deviation for us to get the drugs out of an investigator site and take it to the patient's home while ensuring that the home nurse or the, uh, the doctors are also pretty much available. So honestly speaking, it depends on the therapeutic area that we're talking about. Now let's talk about vaccines, like right? yeah. vaccines is something which requires a cold chain uh, requirement. Now the challenge out there happens is when you start looking at vaccines or oncology drugs where you require intensive cold chain or monitoring process, I think with those kind of therapies and therapeutic areas, direct to patient definitely is going to be a challenge because for you to ensure the chain of custody of the drugs, see till the investigator sites, it's much easier because you have a very controlled chain of custody. Even at the investigator site, at the pharmacist, it's still in a controlled environment. And when you're 
uh, injecting it into the patient's body, it's still in a controlled environment. But just imagine if that cold chain suddenly now leaves the site and starts going to a patient's home. The challenges in terms of one, how do you ensure the temperature maintenance of that product while the product is on its way to the patient's home? Let's assume we did a fantastic job of making sure that we have the right cold chain box and we reach it to the patient's home. The question is, once you open the box, how are you going to maintain that drug in the required temperature environment at the patient's home? Because see, if it's a one-off medication, then you can somehow time it accordingly when the home nurse reaches at the same time, when the drug is reaching at the same time. And we have done that. We have actually done that where it has happened, but that can happen in one-off injectable situations, right? When, when the dosages are not over a period of time, when the medication is not over two weeks or three weeks, you're talking about one-off medication compliance piece of it. Now that's possible, but when if you have a dosage that's going to go over a period of two weeks, imagine where would that patient be keeping that medication in its refrigerator? without a temperature monitor on it. And those are the complications that come from a direct-to-patient perspective. So I believe that if you look at areas right now, DTP could be very well implemented where temperature control is not into play as much as it is a standard therapeutic drug. Diabetes is a great example. Uh, uh, nutritional uh, products are, are great examples of that. Um, medical device testings are great examples of that. You know, if you want to get those sort of testing done, uh, glucometers or some of, some of those stuff that go into the patient's home, they, they're doing their own tests and then shipping it back. All those stuff is definitely possible. Uh, so that's definitely going to be a challenge from depending on what therapeutic areas are you talking about. Perfect. And I was going to move on to obviously sustainability. Now, there's a huge push across all industries regarding this. Now, for companies within cold chain to demonstrate that temperature control packaging and modes of transportation minimize negative effects on the environment, how is that going to be done? You know, will they be able to show that? Yeah, there are there are some good innovations that are happening in the industry at this point of time. I, I won't be able to name names, but I, I recently, last week itself, I was looking at a packaging company uh, that is completely made out of environmental friendly, uh, the outer face material uh, uh, that technically had a very low carbon footprint than the comparatively the standard uh, cold chain boxes that you have, but at the same time are able to give you a 70 to 84 hours temperature uh, controlled environment over a period of time. So I think there is a conscious effort that's happening within the industry at this point of time. I think there's a pressure, not only on the pharmaceutical industry, but even on the service provider side, where every single opportunity to reduce that carbon footprint and um, you know, like the, the whole concept around ESG is something which is yeah. becoming very, very strong talk of the town. So I'm sure it's possible. I think we have come a long way. Absolutely, there's still a long way to be done. I think the bigger challenge happens on the temperature control boxes or the non-temperature control because it's probably much easier to have environmental friendly non-temperature control boxes and the delivery of those drugs, which I think has started happening. If you start looking at many of the uh, drug delivery modes also from a pharmaceutical or from a pharmacy perspective also now they started delivering drugs back to patients home everybody's trying to look at optimizing those boxes and optimizing those opportunities to uh, make it the lowest impact from a carbon footprint perspective but uh, I think the innovation still has to take a little bit of a leap but it's not far off I have seen really good innovations that are helping up uh, at this point of time and I'm sure more will come as we as we start looking at it. Yeah, if you look at the activity, the M&A activity and the advancements being made, this is certainly an industry uh, and a space to be watching over and keeping a close eye on. And uh, look, Sanjay, I appreciate your time and uh, sharing your insights on this topic. No, absolutely. It's, it's, it's great pleasure, Gaur. You're absolutely right. This industry is definitely going through a huge transition at this point of time with all sorts of M&As to the innovation that's happening. I, I will tell you one thing the pandemic has done good is force the industry to start looking at innovation, is yes. to start looking at things which was not acceptable in the past. It has forced the regulators to start accepting data in a different form rather than just a physical data coming out of an investigator's site. So I think there's a lot more to come. I just hope there is, uh, there is a hashtag that's, uh, hashtag that's trending at this point of time. It's called hashtag no looking back. I hope okay. there is no looking back anymore uh, in the pharma industry and that we continue to leverage many of those as we move forward. Couldn't agree more. Thank you again. Thank you. Cheers, mate.